Everybody has a story, and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, we are privileged to have with us Elder Ted Wilson. And he is, as many of you probably know, and if you don't, you will by the end of this, the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Hello, Elder Wilson. Yes. How are you, Elder? <laughs> I realized that, like, normally I call everyone by their first names, but, like, you're Elder Wilson. You've always been Elder Wilson to me, and I can't imagine not calling you Elder Wilson. It's not um, a problem. Anything you want to call me, as long as it's something reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm pretty good at reasonable. Cool. So we've actually known each other for more time than just here because you worked at the review and herald you're the president there for a number of years and that's actually where i first met you right we're gonna call it a couple years ago (laughs) because it'll make us both seem a little bit younger than we probably are um but there's a lot to your life you were recently in a worship and you started speaking some other language i know that you are multilingual would that be accurate how many languages Uh, do you speak i i speak of course english i try to make a good go of that and uh, speak French. Uh, I speak some Russian. I used to be able to speak better, but uh, also I speak a little bit of Arabic. Uh, I grew up in Cairo, and uh, Cairo is my home. I think we're going to talk about that. We are. We're going to get there. (laughs) Um, Actually, let's, let's dive right into there. So, you were, were you born in Cairo? No, my parents uh, went to Egypt uh, in 1944, during the World War II. Oh, wow. And they had to take every method of transportation to get there because of the war. Uh, they went uh, first, I think, to Portugal and then down the coast of West Africa, uh, finally to Congo, and were able to then, by train and bus and riverboat and I don't know what all, get uh, to Egypt uh, in order to avoid the Mediterranean Sea because it was during World War II. They lived in, in Egypt for uh, about 14 and a half years, almost 15 years or so. And I was born kind of in the middle of that. Uh, they were headed back to the U.S. on a furlough. Of course, everything was done by boat then. And um, they got to Tacoma Park, where they were going to stay for six months or so. In those years, uh, furloughs were six months long, uh, whatever. And every six years, you had a furlough. So you (laughs) stayed every year until your furlough. It wasn't like today where we have annual leaves for many of our international service employees. Uh, And uh, so they arrived, and my mother was pregnant at the time. And they went to see a physician uh, in the Tacoma Park area, a very wonderful, well-known Adventist physician. Her name was Dr. Emma Hughes. Uh, And in fact, my my brother-in-law, was delivered by Emma Hughes. Of course, I didn't know him then, of course, or or for a long time, but she was a very wonderful physician. And she checked my mother and, um, you know, yeah, okay, it's going to be another few weeks or whatever. And uh, interestingly, for whatever reasons, there were other plans that God had. And uh, 10 days after they got back to the U.S., I was born. And, of course, it was early and Dr. Hughes had said, well, no, I just saw her today. Well, how is this, you know? But in any case, uh, when I was six months old, uh, we went back to Egypt, or we went to Egypt. And I grew up in Heliopolis, in Cairo, uh, for all that time until I was about eight years old. So, quick question. So, you were a little bit early. Were there any complications because of being delivered early? No, none whatsoever. That's a blessing. As far as I know. (laughs) I don't know. I was a baby. Uh, (laughs) I wasn't sure if maybe you had heard that there were any problems with that. So, so Heliopolis? Heliopolis. Heliopolis. Okay. We're going to try these because I'm sure you're going to give me more words that I'm going to (laughs) kind of struggle through here. So what was it like? How long were you in Egypt? 
as a child? Well, as a child, I was there about uh, seven and a half years. Okay. And yeah. What was that like to grow up in Egypt during these formative years? Well, it was the only experience I had, so I had nothing well, to compare it with. tell me about that experience. <laughs> uh, it was ab- absolutely wonderful. I wouldn't give anything uh, for that experience. It's just marvelous. Uh, growing up in another culture, you learn so many different things. You learn to adjust to many varieties of activities and people, languages, uh, customs, um, and in reality, Egypt is my home, still is my home today. Uh, I feel very connected. My wife, Nancy, knows this. Uh, in fact, <laughs> interestingly, a little uh, parenthesis here. Some years ago, I, well, when we first got married, Nancy was really uh, hesitant about the potential of maybe moving to Egypt or to the Middle East uh, because I <clears throat> had indicated I really enjoyed the Middle East and all of that. And she had this fear and she thought all of my memories about Egypt were just, you know, fantasies of a little eight-year-old or whatever. When we had the opportunity of holding evangelistic meetings in Heliopolis, in the very church that I grew up in. Uh, This is a few years ago. She was able to go to Egypt, and she fell in love with Egypt, with the people, the culture, the food. And she realized I was not dreaming. (laughs) uh, It wasn't just an eight-year-old. Exactly. So growing up there was fascinating, interesting, uh, different you know, cultures. Of course, for me, it was just That mar- was your normal. culture, probably. And uh, it was a, a, a wonderful experience. We lived, uh, from my memory, uh, we lived in another place in Cairo before I can remember that. But uh, we lived right next door to the church, the Heliopolis Church. So we lived in the headquarters of the Nile Union Mission, as it was then called. Now it's the Egypt. Sudan mission. Uh, on the third floor, we had a very nice apartment, and on the roof, uh, it was flat, as most buildings are in Egypt. Uh, it rarely rains in Egypt. In fact, it might rain once every two years. So oh, you don't wow. have any real problem, you know, in terms of uh, having to have pitched roofs and all of that. But in any case, it's a big play area on top of the roof, and you can look out and see the skyline of Cairo and all of that. And uh, then we had a little little yard in the front, you know, and grass, but it was a city, okay? So I grew up in the city, but right next door to the church. And um, we had a veranda, uh, screened-in veranda, and I played a lot there. Uh, was able to ride my tricycle, you know, on the... Do you uh, have siblings? I have a, a younger sister. Her name okay. is Shirley. Uh, she's retired now. She uh, is a nurse and has her doctorate in health education, that kind of thing. So you did have a playmate <clears throat> to kind of play yes. with during all of oh, this yeah. time, too. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, and I had a, had a, a, a wonderful um, canary. A canary? <laughs> yes, the canary's name was Tippy. I still remember that. Uh, so, you know, living in an apartment, you, you, you don't have lots of animals, but we also had a parakeet or two and that kind of thing. But Are you still a bird person? Uh, well, I mean, I like birds. I, I put, so you, you know, you don't feeders have a bird. out. Not now. <laughs> um, we did have a African gray parrot. Oh, those are beautiful. They're wonderful. Uh, Did it talk? He talked a lot. <laughs> uh, we didn't have it in Egypt, but we had it when we were in Africa. So I'm jumping ahead. Yeah, you know. it's okay. We're just talking about birds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we brought him back from Africa to the United States when we returned uh, permanently from our service in Africa. You really can't do that now. I think they have uh, restrictions about that. But this fellow, he was such a cute little guy, and he just 
talked up a storm. And he, I could go on for the next 10 minutes talking about him. But <laughs> what he, was his name? His name was Peanut. Peanut. Because he okay. loved Tippy peanuts. Tippy and Peanut. We got those yeah. two names. And uh, he, he, African greys choose one person that they yes, really they kind of Imprint warm on. up to. And, uh, and I was that person. So he would come and he would put his little head down, want me to rub his head, you know, and all this kind of thing. And, but he, uh, he learned all kinds of things in terms of what to say and all of that. And he could say, uh, uh, I, I can talk. Can you fly? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he would call our girls' names because he listened to everything. And, uh, you know, one little experience uh, Nancy had, this is while he was in the United States when we brought him back, uh, we had some cats in, in our family and three cats for our three daughters. And they were outdoor cats. They would come in once in a while. So Nancy uh, would go to the door when the cats were there and said, do you want out? And, um, and yep, okay, you know, let the cat out and that kind of thing. Well, the bird heard all of this, and everything gets registered <clears throat> with these African greys, as well as other parrots. And um, so one day, uh, Nancy was there in the kitchen, and the bird was in our dining room in his large cage, and she heard a meow. And <laughs> she went to the door, and Peanut said, do you want out? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so Peanut had made the sound of the cat meowing and then told Nancy, do you want out? Because that's the pattern that developed. I mean, it was an amazing thing. But anyway, back to Egypt. It's okay. uh, it's, we actually, my, we have a parrotlet who loves my husband okay. and is very jealous of my husband's affection. So sure. if I come over near my husband, yeah. she, she'll she stand on his shoulder yeah. and look like she's going to get me. Of course. Because, you know, obviously she's more important than I am in his life, Yeah, she, according to her. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so back to Egypt. So quick question. Do you have a favorite food? Oh. Uh, From, e like, Egyptian-type food. Well, there are... Many different foods that, uh, you know, are in the Mediterranean area. Uh, a lot of good Greek food, good Arabic food, Egyptian food. Um, and I actually, that is my favorite food. Nancy knows that. Uh, my second favorite food is Indian food. Our family has a long history with India. My grandfather was president of Southern Asia Division. My father grew up there and uh, many of his siblings. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather spent uh, six years in India. So the connection there is quite heavy. And uh, so that's my second favorite. And then American food is good too. But, what is American? Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> you... <laughs> but um, I love uh, hummus bitahini. Mm -hmm. which is, uh, you know, garbanzos with tahini, tahina or tahini. And uh, then uh, Arabic bread, shami bread, uh, pita bread, people call it. Uh, stuffed grape leaves, fantastic. Um, tomeyas, which is most of the world calls it falafel, but in Egypt we call it tomeya. And uh, marvelous uh, food. Um, also, uh, mangoes. We, I grew up with wonderful, wonderful vegetables and fruit in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, actually, the Nile Delta, which is the area where the children of Israel settled in the land of Goshen, uh, has enormous, um, fertilized land. It's incredible the amount of food that is produced. And you have all kinds of citrus uh, food, uh, fruits, and uh, wonderful fruits, uh, including uh, other fruits like guavas and pomegranates, mm. uh, mangoes, uh, all kinds of things like this. So these are the kinds of things that I grew up on. And whenever I sm even smell a guava, uh, and I love guavas. It just 
immediately takes me back to I've Cairo. Heard, I've heard there's another thing that you really love from the Philippines. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, uh, there is a, a particular fruit that uh, is a delightful fruit. Uh, I, I, that's a, I've heard that that's a... A matter of opinion it is. on delightful. Nancy has tried to like it, but she can't get used to it. It's called durian. And durian, once you get the the hang of it and the and, and the like liking it, you will just you, you just you just love it. It's just fantastic. The smell is interesting, <laughs> but uh, it is a wonderful fruit. And uh, from time to time people will bring me uh, samples from Philippines, and uh, actually the place I first uh, really enjoyed durian was in the country of Indonesia. And uh, the union president uh, at that time, when we were having a meeting, said, look, we're going to have a big feast of durian. Well, okay, so we, we be jumped in, and oh, I tell you, it was just fantastic. But that's a matter of opinion. <laughs> yeah, I they, I have not yet had it. It was not in season when I went over there. But they're like, oh, but Elder Wilson loves it, so you'll love it. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I've heard varying thoughts on this one. So I actually want to pull a different thread. You talked about your love of <clears throat> Indian food, and then you mentioned that your grandfather had worked there. You come from, I know this is your story, but your story is shaped, I believe, by lives of faithfulness that came before you. So I know that your father had ser previously served, worked for the church. I did not know your grandfather had as well. Was your grandfather a first-generation <clears throat> Adventist? Or where? how did Adventism enter into your family? Uh, the interesting thing is that on my father's side, uh, my great-grandparents settled in Northern California. They were from Ireland. And <clears throat> they lived for a period of time in in uh, Canada and then in, in the United States, uh, settling in the Healdsburg area, Northern California. And about that time, there, were, um, there was a strong movement of the Adventist faith. And my great-grandmother became an Adventist to begin with, I think by virtue of a lot of influence from a particular family and that's why it's so important, uh, our personal witnessing to people, sharing the gospel, sharing what Jesus means to us and the Advent movement. Uh, my grandfather, great-grandfather did not become, this is great-grandfather Wilson. Uh, he did not become an Adventist. He was a good, good man. He owned a, some kind of uh, store, you know, where he, general store. And he was also an, an orchard uh, farmer and that kind of thing. But um, he went to a camp meeting in the Healdsburg area because his wife, my great-grandmother, invited him to that camp meeting. Again, that's a really important thing for us to invite people to opportunities to know the Lord and to get better acquainted he went to the camp meeting, and the speaker that day was preaching and ended uh, with a call of commitment. And my great-grandmother was absolutely uh, amazed and confounded, actually, to see my great-grandfather rise and go to the front of the auditorium mm. to take his stand for the, for the Lord and for the Advent movement. And he subsequently became a very strong Seventh-day Adventist and the head elder of the Healdsburg Church. And the person who was preaching that Sabbath day at the camp meeting was Ellen G. White. And uh, so we are so connected not only with the wonderful instruction that God has given to us in the spirit of prophecy through the writings of Ellen White. But our family is tightly connected to her actual presentation of the gospel. 
And she used to come to my grandparents, my great grandparents' home, uh, and uh, they had four sons, one of them being my grandfather. And uh, my grandfather told us uh, that he used to sit at the feet of Ellen White, and she would tell them stories. Mm. So this is a wonderful connection. So that grandfather, who was the third brother out of four, he actually, uh, along with his brothers, became very involved in self-supporting work, as we call it, uh, very much connected with ASI today. Uh, They went to a place called Madison College, and my grandfather was the Bible teacher and the pastor really? at Madison College. Uh, the other three brothers were also very much connected with not only Madison, but the daughter institutions that came out of Madison. Uh, but along the way, after about three or four years at Madison College, my grandfather became part of the organized denominational work. And he and my grandmother spent most of their lives outside of the United States. In fact, he was the president of four world divisions, uh, Southern Asia, Trans-Africa, the what's now known as South Pacific Division, and the North American Division. And interestingly, a few years later, my father was president of North American Division. So I... I I did not realize that. Yeah. That's a... So my, I, I'm a third, <clears throat> third generation uh, ordained minister and pastor, and it's just been a wonderful heritage. My, my grandparents instilled in us a, a love for mission work and for selfless service, as well as my parents uh, did the same thing. My parents, of course, served, as I said, almost 15 years in the Middle East. And um, this is very much connected with who we are as a Wilson family. My mother uh, came from a German-speaking family uh, growing up in Chicago, Illinois. And my grandfather, her father, never became a Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, He was a Roman Catholic. Uh, But, you know, good gentleman in many ways, but I didn't get to know him too too well. He died early in my childhood experience. But my mother's mother, my grandmother, uh, attended evangelistic meetings in Chicago and joined the German-speaking church in Chicago. And I've never met my grandmother. She died when she was about 43 or 44. But one of these days, very soon, in heaven, I'll get to meet her. She was a wonderful lady, as I understand it. Her name was Teresa Werderich Neumann, uh, very German origin. She actually was from Austria. And she and she came from Austria to uh, Chicago. My grandfather came from Hungary, German speaking, uh, to Chicago. And that's where they met and got married, and then she became a Seventh-day Adventist. So uh, from both sides of the family, our interest in spiritual things, in understanding what God wants for your life is very acute. <clears throat> my, my growing up years in terms of respect for the Bible and for the spirit of prophecy uh, was amazing. I never heard one word from either parent in any way denigrating the Bible, the word of God, or the spirit of prophecy. They were very respectful, uh, wonderful parents in so many ways. There comes a time in life though where we have to make our faith our own. You have a, a beautiful heritage. Um, generations of not just pastors, but leaders, missional leaders. Can you identify a time when you were younger where it, it became yours? Or did it always just, you always knew it was? I suppose it was really uh, after graduating from college and uh, 
you begin to understand that the, the life which you're living and the mission on which you are on is not dependent and so tightly connected to your parents. Uh, did you ever struggle with your faith? Did you ever grapple with it? Uh, not really with faith, no. Um, I did struggle a little bit with what I wanted to do in life. It was almost always assumed I was going to be a minister. <laughs> but my parents didn't force me. Uh, I went through a period of time where I was very interested in architecture. I still am. I'm kind of a frustrated amateur architect. I love to redesign things. I've, I've actually helped to design two division offices uh, and just have a great, a great love for that. Um, at home, you know, I've done quite a bit of renovation. That's one of my favorite hobbies is uh, carpet. I have a bathroom if you'd like to come see it. <laughs> I see. Okay. Well, we, could, <laughs> we might, might give some counsel at least on that. Uh, done a lot of renovation, and I still enjoy it very much. Uh, it's a good outlet. Um, Nancy asks me, do you, do, you, do you know what you're doing? I said, well, not really, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you learn from other people. And uh, usually the projects turn out well. Uh, the house has not fallen down yet. And I've been there. <laughs> it isn't. It's beautiful, too. So it's just, you know, an interesting aspect of uh, being able to to use talents and that kind of thing. So architecture is still very much a part of my, uh, my life. I love it. I love design, all that kind of thing. I thought about going into dentistry or medicine or, you know, something else. But the Lord always brought me back to the ministry. You know, we hear a lot about this, the call, this feeling of being called can you try to explain how that is? Because you said, like, you feel all these other things, but you just keep coming up. What does that feel like? Well, for some people, I suppose it's very marked, and they can identify the Lord, you know, in some miraculous way, identify this is what I should do. Uh, for a number of us, uh, it's something that you have a more of a settled conviction on. The Lord just brings a peace and directs you into what you're supposed to do. I'll give you a little experience. Uh, I was not married until uh, one year after uh, being in the pastoral ministry, and that's an interesting experience. Um, Nancy and I were married, which is a whole other story, and it's fascinating, and we praise God how he brought us together. In fact, on the very weekend that I was visiting her parents, getting acquainted with the family, we were not engaged yet, although that weekend we became engaged, uh, we, we called up uh, our grandmothers after we became engaged, and we uh, explained to them what had happened, but they didn't sound very surprised. And both of them were living, uh, my grandfather, well, both sets of, of grandparents were living in what is known as Linda Valley Villa, which is in Loma Linda. And these two grandmothers had spent the weekend fasting and praying for us. And so when they heard that we were engaged, they weren't surprised. Wow. Uh, that's the kind of spiritual involvement, the spiritual connection. Uh, but I was going to tell you about this experience. Before we were engaged, before we were married, we were not connected. Uh, we, we, we dated for a while and then we didn't. And then, you know, so it's the way relationships develop at times. And so I was pastoring in Patchogue, Long Island. New York, way out on Long Island, South Shore. Very little connection to any social involvement and all that, except with church members. And uh, I was not going with Nancy at that time and, or anyone else. And I got discouraged. 
what's the future? Lord, what, what am I going to do? So I contacted my wonderful friend and mentor, who was the principal of Tacoma Academy at that time. Uh, he was the principal of Tacoma Academy for many years. Uh, his name was John Paul Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence, Prof, we would call him. And I contacted Prof. We were very good friends. He was a real mentor. And he said, look, you come and teach at Tacoma Academy uh, Bible. And uh, I'll, I'll introduce you to people at University of Maryland. You can get your doctorate there. And, you know, come and, come and teach. So I thought, that's a good idea. I went down. We even went over to the University of Maryland. He was going to set everything up and teach, I would teach Bible at Tacoma Academy. I went home. And somehow the Lord just impressed me in a huge way that I needed to stay in pastoral ministry. And so I committed myself again to doing that and uh, called up Prof. Lawrence and told him, thank you, but I was going to stay in New York. And it was not long after that that Nancy and I got engaged. So, you know, the Lord just... He, he impresses you as to what you need to do when you are doing what he wants you to do. So I know that you graduated from Columbia Union College, which was WA, which is now Washington Adventist University. Um, so obviously we're going to condense a few years very quickly here. So you come back from Egypt. Where do your parents land? Uh, we lived in California for about a year in uh, Southern California and then uh, San Jose. Uh, and then we came back to uh, Tacoma Park. My father uh, became the Religious Liberty Director for the Columbia Union. And I went to uh, fourth grade at uh, Sligo Elementary School, which is actually in the building, which is now the School of Religion for Washington Adventist University. And uh, then I went to John Nevins Andrews School, JNA, uh, which is a very, was a very uh, famous elementary school, wonderful education there. Uh, principal was Miriam Tymason, one of the all-time great uh, elementary uh, principals. And uh, her husband, Sid Tymason, was later uh, my uh, teacher as well. He was the chair of the business department at uh, Columbia Union College at that time. And I got a double major in, uh, in religion and in business administration. Uh, and I think at the prompting of my father. So um, I grew up in Tacoma Park for about 10 years and uh, belonged to the Tacoma Park Church and the Sligo Church and was very much involved in um, activities, uh, musical activities, and extracurricular activities, and school, you know, w Is this when, where when you it was needed. met Nancy in school? <laughs> you just needed. Is this where you met Nancy? No, no, that's a long story. I, I saw her for the first time at the Tacoma Park Church when uh, two of our mutual friends, uh, the lady that was getting married was her friend, but I knew both of these individuals. And I saw her, she was in the wedding, and I said, who is that girl? And uh, someone told me, no, no, don't, don't worry about her. She's dating somebody else, you know. And actually come to find out these people were trying to protect this fellow whom they wanted yeah. to date Nancy. <laughs> but in any case, it wasn't until that about... That didn't work out for. <laughs> it wasn't until about four years later when I was at Loma Linda studying in the School of Health, School of Public Health, that I met Nancy. Nancy was by that time a registered physical therapist and teaching and also practicing at Loma Linda. And uh, we then met, and uh, that's an interesting story of how God leads and all of that. But eventually then, of course, we got married. And uh, we, uh, we started our work uh, in pastoral ministry on Long Island in this place called Patchog, and uh, wonderful church. I learned so much. I learned more in one year in pastoring than I did in, you know, so much of my education 
uh, graduate education, you, you learn the reality of how to deal with people and all the challenges they face and soul winning and all kinds of things. So Nancy and I were there uh, for about a year together, uh, pastoring, and then I joined what was called Metropolitan Ministries for New York, the metropolitan area of New York. We worked in that for about five years and uh, then took a call uh, to Africa. Let's talk about this. So you've married the love of your life, and I've seen you together. I know she is the love of your life. You light up when she's around. But so you and Nancy and Mary, she has to have kind of known who your family is. Did she, I mean, because you don't know where you're going to be called and how you're going to be called and all that. That's true. But that did that ever worry her? Or was she always open to this idea of like, oh, maybe we'll just be missionaries around the world or maybe my husband will end up in administration. You know, it's one thing to marry a pastor. It's a very different thing to, <clears throat> to marry an administrator leader, missionary kind of a person. Well, interestingly, she tells me she had it in mind to never marry a minister. <laughs> uh, but that changed. I hear that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord simply had other plans. Um, also, we were in pastoring there, the, the Patchog Church, and... Um, one of my friends uh, who worked with my father, uh, his name was Don Roth, Elder Roth. He was working in secretariat at the time in the General Conference, and he sent some mission blanks, mission information blanks to us to fill out. He said, you need to, you need to be in the mission field. You need to go, you know, as missionaries. Well, I received those forms, and... Uh, as I recall, filled out mine, and I put this form in front of Nancy, and she just broke down crying. No, 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 you don't understand. I cannot leave my family. No, no, no. You see, originally, she's from uh, Asheville, North Carolina, up in the mountains, and uh, <clears throat> she had dreams of going back to Asheville, you know, and spending the rest of her life there, and she's done everything but that. I was going to say that didn't really happen. <laughs> And uh, so she was very connected with her family, still is. Uh, and she said, no, I can't do this. And she so okay, forget, forget the mission blanks. So it wasn't until about five years later that circumstances led to her being willing to at least fill out mission blanks. And eventually uh, she agreed that we would be able to go overseas as missionaries. And she's a living witness that when you follow what God wants, that he will bless you. And she's, been, she's a great missionary. She spent, we spent nine years in West Africa living in Abidjan. And, uh, Wait, you said that name. What country is that? In? Like, I know what country it is, but for those of us who yeah. maybe don't know, what country uh, the is official, that? The official name is in French, Côte d'Ivoire, but uh, it's Ivory Coast. It's in West Africa, next to Ghana, next to Liberia, uh, south of uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, and uh, it was a wonderful place to what work. What did you do there? Well, I went there to begin with, <clears throat> excuse me, as a ministerial and stewardship secretary uh, for the division. It was called the Africa Indian Ocean Division. It covered uh, West Africa, Central Africa, and the Indian Ocean area, primarily French-speaking, but some English as well. Uh, I was also health and temperance uh, director for the division. And eventually, <clears throat> they asked if I would assist in secretariat. So I was an assistant secretary of that division and then became the secretary of the division. Uh, our girls grew up in Africa. They feel very much at home in an international setting. Uh, they loved Africa. In fact, when we received a call then to join the secretariat at the General Conference after spending about nine years in Africa, uh, our oldest daughter was pretty much devastated. She just couldn't even imagine not living in Africa. So we left the other two girls with our with Nancy's mother, 
And uh, then Emily, our oldest, uh, went with us to look for a house here in the Washington area. So you have three daughters. Wonderful daughters. Three wonderful daughters. Yes. Um, I I think I've actually met all of them Mm. at some point here. So they were all born in Africa? Or where where did they come into the... No, actually, two of them were born in New York when we were serving in Metropolitan Ministries. And uh, they were born in Nyack, New York, which is right on the Hudson River. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Catherine was born in the United States when Nancy came back uh, during a furlough or some leave um, trip that we had made. And actually, we needed to leave and return to Africa, but Catherine was not cooperating, and uh, the birth did not take place. So finally, <laughs> finally, uh, she was Nancy was induced because Catherine was over the period of time, the normal period of time, because we had to get a passport also for this little one, and that takes about three weeks and all of that. So. Catherine was then born, a wonderful little daughter, and um, we got a passport for her, a three-week-old picture, you know, on there, or two weeks. It's probably so precious. It it was amazing. Do you still have that passport? uh, You know, somewhere probably. I don't know. (laughs) So so you have Catherine as your youngest, and then I believe it's, is it Elizabeth and Emily? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And they are all uh, professionals in their own right uh, now and have... Families of their own. Uh, Emily is a, a registered nurse, has her master's in a certain area of nursing, and uh, also her master's in public health, and is also an English teacher uh, and a graphic artist. And she's, you know, <laughs> but she's homeschooling her children right now, three of them. And uh, Elizabeth is a registered nurse uh, with a, a BS in, in nursing and uh, is practicing nursing and uh, has three wonderful children. They had a fourth who very sadly died about two years ago, uh, little James, wonderful little fellow. Uh, about age eight, just about, he died. But we'll see him again soon. Jesus Amen. is coming. And then Catherine uh, and her husband have four children. And so we have 10 living grandchildren. And we just had them uh, with us at Christmas time. All of us, 18 of us under one roof. That's uh, a lot of people under one roof. A lot of, a lot of people. <laughs> and Nancy calls, uh, calls it uh, chaotic bliss. And, uh, but the cousins just have such a great time together. And they just, just have a... A wonderful time exploring the property where we are and just having a lot of fun. But um, these three wonderful daughters and our sons-in-law, of course, helped to form our our family. And it's just a privilege to to see our daughters so strong in the faith and uh, strong believers in the Lord and in the Seventh Day Adventist message, and to see their children, our grandchildren, growing. In the Lord. In fact, I had the privilege just the other day of baptizing uh, Catherine and Bob's firstborn, uh, Charlotte, and uh, she's 13 now. And it was a privilege to baptize her in Spokane, Washington. So, all of your children are still in the church, very faithful. During these early years, you know, they're being raised in a very mission environment in Africa. Were there things that you and Nancy did to try to instill this firm foundation for them? Uh, Many things. Of course, we're, as any new parents, you're learning as you go. Yes, we do. And we (laughs) lean on the Lord. Um, But he he helps to fill in the gaps. Thank Uh, the Lord for that, too. Yes, amen. (laughs) Uh, we were very faithful in uh, reading to them spiritual things, uh, helping them to understand the need to stay close to the Lord, to study the, the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Uh, we talked to them a lot. We discussed things a lot, and we still do. 
in fact, not too long ago, I prepared a comprehensive list of things that I wanted them to always remember, uh, spiritually connected, many, many of them, and also heritage, their family and all of that. Uh, I think it's really important to stay close to your children even as you grow older and as they grow older. It's vital. Today it's so easy with cell phones and all that. Years ago to stay in contact with family meant writing letters or taping something on a cassette tape if some people remember what that was. Uh, it, but today it's so easy and it's so important not just to stay in touch socially, but to discuss spiritual things and to encourage your children, to help your children rem remember that they are uh, given a special opportunity by the Lord to do something for him and to realize that the mission of the church is, is our mission, everybody's mission. And also to tell your children, I, I had this experience from my parents, and it was just marvelous. My parents would tell me, we believe in you. And I tell my daughters that. It's so important that we not denigrate them or criticize them a lot. Help them to be nurtured in the Lord and believe in them. The Lord has a purpose for their lives. And they, they know that. Our daughters know that. And they have stayed so aligned with the Lord, and we praise God for that. So you come back from Africa, obviously much to your daughter's sadness, great sadness. And you're at the General Conference? Yes. At that point as a— Secretariat, as Associate okay. Secretary. What areas did you oversee? As associate secretary, uh, I oversaw the the uh, sending of missionaries and also as a liaison with the what is now known as the Inter European Division, and also what we now know as the West Central Africa Division, where we served, and also the Southern Asia Division, where my grandparents and served and my father grew up. So that was my activity, plus uh, also helping to facilitate uh, the nurturing of young people on campuses for, for mission service and that kind of thing. <clears throat> when does your father become president of the General Conference? Uh, he, or was he already president before this time, or where in your story does that fit in? He became president in... 1978, actually officially January 1, 1979, uh, the president before him, Elder Robert Pearson, uh, developed some health problems, and so he announced that he would be retiring at, a, at an annual council in 1978. And so at that time, uh, they went through a nominating process, and Dad was elected president to begin January 1, 1979. What was that like for you? Yeah, that was a very interesting experience. Uh, it, I was very proud of my father and my parents. Uh, I loved my parents and uh, look forward to seeing them again. Um, I, I never had an experience growing up as some young people do who grew up in pastoral homes of ever resenting the fact that my father was a pastor. I, I thought it was wonderful. Uh, it was great. Uh, when he became president of the General Conference, we were working in New York at that time in Metropolitan Ministries, and, uh, you know, the relationships change in terms of official connections and all that. Our relationship at home, of course, never changed. But... Um, I was very, uh, very glad that my father was the president and very proud of him and supportive. And uh, I leaned on him a lot, as well as my mother, uh, for 
guidance for information. I used to call him a lot. I used to, you know, be in touch with him a lot. Uh, much of how I do things and how I approach things, uh, I learned from him by observing him, by listening, uh, and also instruction that he would give. How to deal with people, how to be fair, how to uh, not uh, be partial as much as you can. You, you need to be open to various uh, uh, responses by people and then make a decision, you know, leaning on the Lord. Uh, so I learned a lot from dad in terms of also international connections, uh, protocol aspects, uh, dealing with, um, with world leaders and other people, you know, in other churches and all this kind of thing, how to, how to re relate and, and to, to interact always maintaining your steadfast conviction in the Seventh-day Adventist faith, and, uh, but helping people to understand who we are and that kind of thing. So it didn't change a whole lot because dad was dad, you know, and my, my mother was my mother, you know, but they did a lot of traveling internationally then, of course, and uh, so once in a while we would see them, <laughs> and that was good. Uh, I learned a lot from my mother as well, she had an uh, interesting philosophy when there was a problem, when there was, you know, challenges. She said, well, you know, this too shall pass. <laughs> and uh, so she just kind of, you know, helped in an interesting way also. She basically raised my sister and me uh, because my father was traveling so much and all of that. So we owe so much to both of our parents. So you... You come back, you're, you've served as associate secretary, and I believe you get another call. Yes, that was a real surprise, huge surprise. Uh, we, your girls are like teenagers well, at this time. Our yeah. oldest daughter was, yes, about 13 or so, 14 maybe. And we had come back. I thought we would stay in Africa for at least another couple of years, uh, but... Uh, we were called to the general conference in secretariat and out of the blue, basically, uh, I was asked if I would be interested in going to the Euro Asia division to Russia. Uh, many people were interested in holding evangelistic meetings there and, in helping and all of that. We had just returned from, uh, from Africa you know, year, year and a half before that or so. And, and we were just settling in to the United States. You know, it, it actually takes quite a bit to resettle into the, the, the homeland where you're from when you've lived in a different culture. Uh, it's, living in an international setting is just an amazing gift and an opportunity, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And even for our children, the, the children, are, our daughters are internationalists, essentially. And it's a wonderful thing. But um, they were, we were asked to go to Russia. We, we didn't want to go. We didn't feel really called to go. But we were really Im impressed by a lot of people, I guess, that we should try to go. And, and so we said, okay, Lord. Finally, we said, all right, we'll we'll consider it. We were asked then to go, and we wouldn't trade that experience for anything. We were connected with the uh, Euro-Asia Division for about four years, lived in Moscow for about three years, and it was a thrilling experience to see God's hand working in our lives on a daily basis. I mean, we had all kinds of challenges. Difficult. It was hard to do anything at that time. Communism had just fallen, uh, food was scarce. It was hard to find food. There was food out in the fields and everything, but to get it to the cities was difficult. Um, it, to make a phone call was hard. Uh, to, to travel on an airplane was difficult. Everything was difficult. The, the whole Soviet system had imploded. And, uh, but it was, we had the mafia threats then and all kinds of things. We saw so many miracles, and it was just 
so faith assuring and we loved the people. Do you have a specific miracle you want to share? Well, uh, there was one particular situation, a, cu a couple of them, where mafia threats uh, were very, very prominent. And at the seminary, uh, a local mafia boss came and was harassing our seminary at Zahoksky. And they were expecting uh, protection money and all of this kind of thing. Uh, and they were threatening our people. Our people were standing very firm. And uh, interestingly, about a day before the mafia boss was going to come back and harass our seminary to an even greater extent, uh, his relationships obviously were, with others was very frayed as well. And uh, he was killed. And the Lord just preserved Zoxky and the school kept going without hassle. Nancy worked at our dental clinic in Moscow for a period of time. Uh, she's a physical therapist, uh, and they also had physical therapy activity there. Uh, and again, the mafia was, was just harassing. But interestingly, when the mafia came back to really put the pressure on, something happened because people were praying all around the world and they were posting on the walls in our uh, dental clinic there, our health center. Uh, they were posting on the walls these prayer requests to, to maintain security against the mafia forces and the satanic forces. And the mafia came and something happened unexplainable. Uh, people can't explain it even to this day. They came, they looked as if they had seen something supernatural, and they left and they never bothered the clinic again. Wow. So God, God, you know, worked in miraculous ways, personally, as well as for the church, and he's still doing that today in spite of the challenges that are being faced in that part of the world. So you serve in Euro Asia Division for how long? Uh, we were there, we're living about three years in Moscow, but connected about four years. We were learning Russian, and uh, I was traveling back and forth uh, during a period of time at the beginning. And then you get a call back to America, I believe. Yes. Right? <laughs> it's really just kind of like a back and forth to America thing here. Yeah. And is this when you were called to the review? Yes. And Harold Publishing. Cause yes. Because this is where we meet. Yes. Finally. Um, this is publishing now. So you you haven't really touched publishing much, have you? No. What is it like? Because um, Review and Harold Publishing Association is, because it's still around, is one of our longest running ministries, media yeah, ministries. It has a powerful impact. I remember as a kid waiting for camp meetings so I could find the next book to buy. What was it like to be called to a publishing house? And what were some of the challenges that you faced with it? Well, I can still remember um, I was in our apartment in Russia <clears throat> in the Euro-Asia Division office in Moscow. And we had many apartments in there also. And... Um, I can remember um, the president of the General Conference and uh, two vice presidents, uh, president, a vice president of the General Conference and a division president who was also vice president. They were calling me on the phone and saying, you need to come to the Review and Herald. And I had thought the plans were for me to return to secretariat in the General Conference and to help with uh, inspiring young people in volunteerism. But they said, no, no, we want you to go to the Review and Herald. I said, I, I don't know anything about publishing, really. I'm not really, you know, in that line of activity. No, no, we think you can do good. You can learn. You can, you know. So finally, I agreed to go. And that was a huge learning experience for me. Uh, I would spend... Uh, Usually once a week I would spend time uh, 
visiting in different parts of the building and at times actually doing the work in shipping, in uh, the press room, in the bindery, in, uh, you know, different places. And um, I, I hope I didn't uh, retard the work too much by doing that. But it was an interesting opportunity to learn uh, right on the job, so to speak. And, of course, uh, the Review and Herald is uh, our oldest uh, organization. Uh, it still exists, not in the same format, but it still exists. And interestingly, I am actually the president of the Review and Herald as well, uh, Pastor Douglas, uh, Paul Douglas, our treasurer of the General Conference, is uh, kind of the, the treasurer of the Review and Herald. And so uh, we have one, one full-time employee, and uh, Melinda Warden, who is our vice president for operations, and she does a tremendous job. But uh, we still do a lot of processing of old uh, books that were uh, in in our possession, manuscripts, and also looking towards new things that we're going to be doing. Uh, interestingly, in the next few months, I will be assisting with the 150th anniversary of the Pacific Press Publishing House oh, wow. uh, Association, and that will be a tremendous blessing there in Boise, Idaho. But publishing was something that I got into, and you know, once you get into publishing, it's a very fascinating area. Uh, in many parts of the world, it is still flourishing quite well. In other parts, it has not gone as well because people don't go door to door in selling things in some parts of the world now. But the work that is being done by our publishing houses electronically and also hard copy is absolutely essential. And uh, the publishing work is, as the Spirit of Prophecy has indicated, it is basically typified by the fourth angel of Revelation 18, verses 1 to 4, calling people out of Babylon. It is a precious ministry. So I learned a lot at the Review, and uh, it was a beautiful experience in many ways, challenging and tough. We had to lean on the Lord a lot, but uh, that's what we need to do. So and you, that's where I met you and my husband. your husband. Yes. Your, well, your husband. you met me because of my husband, because he worked he worked at the Review and Herald for I think seventeen or eighteen years. He was one of the graphic designers and uh, and a good one. He was. He still <laughs> is a good graphic designer. But um, yeah, we publishing has always been in my because like I was a call porter, and which is actually how I ended up kind of in there um, was because George King Institute. Mm -hmm. um, we hosted that we hosted at there. the Review and Herald. So small mission college situated on the campus of yes. the Review and Herald and trying to encourage young people, which kind of goes back to what you were wanting to do anyway. So you thought you'd go back to secretariat to kind of do it. And here, even at the Review and Herald, you're still being able to inspire young people right. to live a life of mission. Right. Um, maybe in a little bit of a different way than you envisioned, but it was always very inspiring. So there was, a, how many years were you there? Uh, about four years. Okay, four mm -hmm. years. Four and a half or so almost. And then you four were called so. back to the general conference, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. To serve as a general vice president. That's right. Yep. So. And that, I, I'll just say it's also interesting because when you transition jobs, many times you have to do both jobs <laughs> at the same time. So there was a period of time for three, four, or five months I was – trying to help the Review and Herald as well as get into my work at the General Conference. But you know what? The Lord helps you through all those things. Your days are so packed and everything else, and many times they're packed right now. Uh, we just came back from a, a visit to New York City where we were at the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church celebrating their 100th anniversary. And, uh, you know, there's so many aspects of my work that are thrilling and inspiring and that help us to focus on the real mission of the church which is lifting up Jesus his word his righteousness his precious three angels messages of revelation 14 and his soon coming 
and, uh, and his health message and so many aspects that helped to make the Seventh-day Adventist message unique. But uh, that was just sharing that, yes, sometimes you have to do double duty, but whatever it is, the Lord helps you through. So you serve as a general vice president for a number of years. And then at a general conference session, you must have gotten a call or someone come visit you. How did the call to become president happen? <laughs> well, that's dependent upon number one, the Lord and nominating committee. Yeah, but who, how did you, how were you informed of this? Was it a phone call? Or? Yes, yes. Uh, it was a phone call by a, uh, a very wonderful friend of ours, uh, Orville Parchment, who was serving as the assistant to the president for uh, Elder Paulson. And uh, he also, the assistant to the president, serves as a kind of coordinator in the nominating committee. And so I was called and told to come and they would explain things, I guess. <laughs> what was that moment like? You've, se you've seen your father in this position and you've already decided that your life is a life of service. You have this whole legacy of family members accepting these calls to do hard things. Because let's be honest, being the president of the Adventist Church is not an easy job. Um, you know, people are like, oh, you get to travel. The traveling is, is actually a lot harder than I think most people are going, would ever know. It gets kind of old after a while <laughs> sometimes. But. but the things we love to visit yeah, and yeah. to be able to, to inspire. See people, and, encourage them. Yeah, so, it's, so you, we struggle with this. But you have your great-grandfather, and you have your grandfather, and then you have your father, and you have all of these legacies that you've built on, and you receive this call. And some people could say, well, it seems inevitable. You know, you've served at divisions, you've served as a president of the Review and Herald, you've been a general VP. But even in spite of that, we don't know how God is going to lead. We don't know where God is going to place us. In that moment that you get this call from um, Orville Parchment, what goes through your mind? Well, you're extremely sobered and humbled and... You're challenged because this is something extraordinary in a way. And you just have to lean on the Lord and on his holy word and on the spirit of prophecy to guide as to what you're going to do. And you, you have, you know, we have a wonderful team of workers in many ways that we're working with currently. Uh, many people that you depend on in whatever setting you get into. But when it comes down to it, especially if you're going to be the called to be the head of the organization, whatever organization it is, you have to realize that essentially the decision-making and the processing of things ends up in your hands, not that you make all the decisions yourself, certainly not. You work with a team. We, we, we have a committee system in the church. Uh, the president, the secretary, and treasurer uh, work together as a team. Uh, the, 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 the treasurer and the secretary do not report to the president. They report to the committee. But we work together in a very symbiotic relationship. But you do realize that as the chief officer, if you want to call it that, uh, you have some pretty difficult challenges to face. And you learn that, well, every morning I ask the Lord for wisdom. James 1.5, basically, you ask for wisdom. And the Lord gives it to you. So when you get a call like that, you you know, a thousand things run through your mind and how you're going to handle this and this and this and how are you going to face uh, the challenges ahead. But you learn to take one step at a time and to lean on the Lord. 
and realize that he will lead you through working with all those that he has asked to accompany you on this journey. So, you know, it very sobering time, I'll tell you that. And, and Nancy, of course, was very sobered by all of this because it puts you into a, if I can say, a kind of a spotlight where people are watching you, you're, they're criticizing you, they're saying all kinds of strange things about you. And after a while, you learn not to worry about a how lot do you, of that stuff. How do you handle criticism? Yeah, you know, you just need to lean again on the Lord and his word. And if you're doing what you think God has asked you to do, you don't worry about uh, all the the chattering and all the, the challenges. Uh, you you don't want to be oblivious to something that you're, if you're doing something wrong. But there are a lot of people who just want to criticize because they just, they just like to do it, or they have a completely different worldview from yours. I think sometimes, too, they don't actually understand the structure of the church. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen this a lot where it's like, well, why doesn't the General Conference do that? And I'm like, well, we can't. <laughs> like, you know, that's actually a conference-level decision. We can't go past the union and the division to just lay down. That's not how the system works. Yeah, it's not a command and control operation. <clears throat> it's a committee system. You work with people. You work with organizations. Uh, you have you you work primarily with influence and encouragement, spiritual uh, uh, encouragement. You pray with people. You help them see a bigger vision. Uh, it's not a it's not a situation where you can just say. Okay, that's exactly what's going to happen, and that's what happens. Uh, in rare instances, in certain settings, you do have certain authority, absolutely. But you learn that you need to work together with many different people from many parts of the world. We have uh, over 22 million members, uh, many cultures, many different ways of looking at things, and you have to... You have to work with everyone. The beautiful thing is that the, the gospel message, the, the biblical message, is foundational to all that we do. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church is held together by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not something that, you know, we, we, have, we have our constitution and bylaws, we have our policies, we, we, we have our meetings, uh, we have our structure, and all of that is important and good. But it is... It is the Holy Spirit that he holds this church together. And this church is God's precious movement, Advent movement, that he has organized for the proclamation of the three angels' messages at the very end of time. And we're living in those times right now. And it's so important that we, that we share with others uh, through every possible means, total member involvement, as we talk about, uh, through, through uh, global total member involvement now, everybody doing something for the Lord, through mission to the cities, through comprehensive health ministry. And, and, and this is good to have a good glass of water yeah, here. You like that? I yeah, have water yeah, on is, set. <laughs> be able to drink some good water, uh, health reform, all of that. And actually, let me tell you that Medical missionary work, comprehensive health ministry, is the right arm to the gospel. And so when we're dealing with trying to reach people in the cities, even in rural areas, uh, health outreach is, is so vital. Uh, my father encouraged me to not only go to the seminary and get a Master of Divinity degree, but a conjoint program that uh, was in vogue at that time in, in operation, uh, where you could get a Master of Science in Public Health from Loma Linda and a Master of Divinity from uh, Andrews University in a conjoint program uh, where your electives in certain areas would cross over. And it has been a huge blessing to me to have that combination and to have that perspective. Uh, plus, it was at Loma Linda where I met Nancy, so that was a, so that's a wonderful <laughs> blessing as well. But to get back to the question about how do you feel, how do you approach things when you're 
asked to lead an organization, um, sometimes I just have to think, you know, this is, this is an amazing situation. And I just have to lean on the Lord. And ultimately, God is in control. And you're not the one in, quotes, control. It's God who is in control. And he's going to see this Advent movement triumphantly to the end. We're going to go through a lot of challenges. I mean, you want to know the challenges? Just read The Great Controversy, the book The Great Controversy. We were headed for some very, very difficult times. Uh, and I see all around the world, as Nancy and I travel, things are imploding, not only in one culture, but all over the world. Uh, situations are just devolving into chaos and into difficulty because people are not following the Word of God. So our real mission is to help Seventh-day Adventists worldwide uh, to lift their vision and to see what this church is all about and its unique message, its unique mission. And God has asked us to carry this out, and that's what uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has to remember, never to forget its true mission. We're not just one of many denominations. This is the Advent movement. This is a unique situation. And God will bless his church as uh, we lift up full biblical truth. Amen. As we close up, I just have one final question for you. We kind of just visited on the fact that you have this legacy. There's a lot of people who watch this that maybe their parents and their children aren't in the faith anymore. Or maybe they are grappling with it. You know, their young people are in college and they're kind of struggling through it. Or maybe they're newer parents trying to figure out, okay, what words of wisdom or inspiration would you like to give to these people about the passing on of legacy? Your opportunity as parents and even young people who are watching, um, you have such an amazing opportunity to affect lives. We do, we're not islands to ourselves. We are interactive with people and our people around us, and we are not to live for self. Uh, the biggest challenge that the Seventh-day Adventist Church faces is not uh, some nuclear holocaust or religious persecution in the future. The biggest challenge we face is self, pride, personal pride. And when you learn that Christ exhibited such selflessness and that he wants us to take on his characteristics through his sanctifying righteousness. We have his justifying righteousness and his sanctifying righteousness. Those two components of his righteousness can be ours through our connection with him on a daily basis. When that takes place, the Lord does something in your heart so that you then be are able or you will be able to to relate to people and to encourage them and those parents who are struggling with challenges with their young 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 people or others uh, remember that the lord will work through you when you submit to him on a mm -hmm. daily basis yourself and never stop praying for your children never stop yearning for them to be part of not just the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is a magnificent and wonderful privilege, but the Seventh-day Adventist Church means you're part of God's family. And God wants all of us to be part of his family. That's what the plan of salvation is all about. So God is asking for us to relate to people who may be struggling, not just waving our finger at them and waving a book around or the Bible and saying, you should be doing this, but modeling what it means to truly have the God of the universe who loves us beyond mm -hmm. compare, that we love our children, young people, others who are departing from where they ought to be, and 
that we draw them back and we pray for them and we ask the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. Um, and, you know, I, I want to just kind of share this one verse, which is probably my favorite verse in the Scripture. It's, I have many, many wonderful favorite passages, but this one is just fantastic. It's in the little book of Joel, and it's chapter 2 and verse 21. And it says, and this is the King James Version, uh, other versions will have a little different approach to it, but it says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. So you can put your name right in there. Fear not, Alyssa. Fear not, Ted. Uh, be glad and rejoice. Don't, don't be downcast. Don't be discouraged. Don't be disappointed. Don't be cynical. Don't, don't be critical. You know, that's one thing. There's so much criticism and cynicism in mm. the world today, in, in the, and even in the Adventist church. Everything is kind of, you know, not everything. Many people are just so pessimistic and so cynical. Don't be that way. Just realize that the Lord has a plan for every one of our lives, and he has a plan for this church, and it's going to end gloriously, even though it's going to go through a time in which if the Lord doesn't cut it short in righteousness, uh, we would die. Uh, but the Lord has a plan. And be glad and rejoice. You know, in, in New Testament it says, rejoice even in your difficulties and in your problems. Rejoice uh, evermore. Rejoice. Give thanks to God. So be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Believe that the Lord is real, that he is absolutely in control of things, and ultimately things will turn out according to his will. Amen. And uh, that's one thing that carries me through. You know, you're talking about challenges and frustrations and being called. I have this wonderful belief that ultimately truth will prevail. Amen. And that to me is an assurance for a parent who's dealing with their wayward child or a challenge that you have in your local church or a challenge you have in your work situation or with a spouse or whatever it is, that if you lean on the Lord completely and base your trust in Him, ultimately truth will prevail and God will see you through. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today, Elder Wilson. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Anna and Profiles with my special guest, Elder Ted Wilson. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast, YouTube channel, wherever you are tuning in from today. I don't want you to miss any future episodes. Thank you for spending this time with me and join us next week as we continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people.